the boiling cauldron of the Dordogne, Miguel Indurain exhausted his rivals in the time trial to take the overall lead in emphatic style. The press suddenly had refound the man they'd hardly spoken to in 10 days of racing. Overall, Indurain has opened the gaps. He leads Tony Rominger of Switzerland and the Frenchman Armand de las Cuevas. Britain's Chris Bourbon retains seventh place overall and Sean Yates is eighth. Both of them great performances. So big Miguel Indurain has assumed his leadership of this year's Tour de France and today it should be fairly routine as he comes away from the Dordogne and races in very hot conditions down to a first ever finish here in Cahors. But for Chris Boardman yesterday, he was very tired in that time trial and it seems the time has now come for him to consider his future in the race. Here's Gary Imlach. Yesterday wasn't so much a time as a temperature trial for Chris Boardman. In fact, for the second half of the stage, he did without the extra streamlining of his aerodynamic helmet in an effort to get even slight relief from the scorching heat. It was a good ride, but by the end, Chris looked ready to leave the tour. A couple of hours later, though, he had a new helmet and new hope. Yeah, I mean, in the middle of the time, so I thought, no, this is it. I'm, I'm really doing a lot of damage here. Uh, I'm not going for the overall general classification this year. So I thought that's not, not a good idea to just turn myself in, inside out just to say that I've finished. But after the finish and after the recovered and I got in the pool here just to, uh, just to cool off, I felt a bit better and I'm going to see how it goes tomorrow. But uh, if I'm really getting, getting a hide in tomorrow, then uh, I'll call it a day. Okay, and if not tomorrow, then what, the rest day? Well, literally take it day by day. I'm not going to head for a particular point and, and, and really bury myself to get there. Uh, I'm just going on what my body's saying. Uh, this is the most important thing this year, but there are other objectives. There is the World Championships in three weeks, four weeks' time, and that's very important too. So uh, I'm going to have to be realistic. And it's difficult to get, you get sucked into being in this race and trying to go a bit further and the people are trying to encourage me to do things but they've all got great ideas for my legs and only I know how they feel. Well Chris has signed in this morning he's decided to go on and see what happens I know that his manager would like him to stay in this race until the Pyrenees tomorrow. 175 riders still survive as the mountains approach and after a good night's sleep followed by a lion this morning as the start wasn't until 12.26. In yellow, a familiar colour for Miguel Indurain, who likens himself to a lizard and loves the heat. He can expect plenty of that too on the 160 kilometres ride away from Bergerac now as they head towards the department of the Lot and Cahors. Three small climbs, three sprints, and it's the last, by the way, for the small time bonuses. They end today. Well, it's another real scorcher today, Phil, with hardly a breath of wind in the air and temperatures roaring up into the high 30s. No peace either, Paul, today, because an attack began after only four kilometres, and Jean-Luc Bortolami, fourth overall, was the first man over the top of the Côte de Castin after 26 kilometres. Joining him on the escape, the national champion of France, Jackie Durand, the youngest man in the race, Marco Serpolini, and the Australian flyer, Stephen Hodge. There were two sprints on the way. Bortolami won one, and Jackie Durand had won one, and by the time they'd gone through Salah after 72 kilometres, they were four minutes in the lead. And so the four leaders are still clear and they're now on the climb of the Côte de Montfaucon. 118 kilometres covered and the lead has not lost a lot. It's now three minutes and 30 seconds. The very latest check has just come in off the course and the rider's being told that now. So Gianluca Bortolami on the left of our picture. At the back here, number 77, is Marco Serpolini, the youngest man in the Tour de France. The national champion of France is there too on the far right. That is Jackie Durand. And then the other rider is the Australian, Stephen Hodge. Good to see an Australian on the attack now. And all four of the Aussies in this race, I can tell you, are enjoying the tour now and beginning to settle in. They're a tough breed. Now we go over towards the top of the climb. It's only a fourth category climb. The Bortle Army has been the powerhouse, not surprisingly, because he's still into second place overall on the road and wants to keep it that way. But there are signs that Indurain's team are going to close it down. The race going very quickly indeed. There's the main field now threading its way towards the climb at Montfaucon. And I can tell you that the speed has been tremendous today, 27 miles an hour, and they've done well to hold that lead. They really have over a course like this because they're very tough roads here. I know them. I've ridden several times down here when I rode for a French team, and these roads, especially in this heat, are even harder. The Bonesto team are doing an excellent job at the front, just keeping the tempo nicely, 
to bring this group back slowly, slowly. They've been up around almost five minutes at one stage, and it's come down now to three and a half minutes. But they're starting to suffer the four riders in the front. You can see, by the way, they're nodding around a little bit. Every time it slows down, though, Bortolami is the man who goes to the front to egg them on and to push them a little bit harder. Well, this has been an excellent attack by Bortolami, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's been suggested to him by his team captain, Tony Rominger, a chance perhaps for him to take the yellow jersey, but even more for Rominger's Mapai team to take a bit of a rest today and make the Bonesto team chase, because tomorrow the Pyrenees begin with a climb. The tour has never been up tomorrow to finish the stage, and everybody is saying they will be very, very surprised. It's steep, and it climbs very quickly to great heights and should provide with a terrific climax at the finish tomorrow. And everybody looking to see if Rominger and Indurain are going to fight this tour out and we'll know tomorrow. Giron, always trying. He's been featured in a number of uh, long breakaways this year in the Tour de France and I hope he can land the first win for France, which will be very befitting of him, being the champion of France for a second successive year. Bortolami, a change man since he won uh, two stages in the Kellogg's Tour of Britain on two separate visits. The one I remember was his great finish outside the City Hall in Manchester there. And that was on a rather wet and greasy day when other riders in the leading group crashed off on the fi final bend. But he stayed upright, won the day. And uh, they're all experienced except Sir Polini riding his first tour. And the young man, 21 years of age, former junior world champion back in 1990, but I can't find him having done hardly anything else since then. Jackie Duran's an excellent rider as well, but strangely enough, he doesn't win very many races, but when he does, it's always a big one. He's been the French national champion on two occasions, having won that title for the second time just the Sunday before the Tour de France started, and then a couple of years ago, there was that long breakaway, and he took the Tour of Flanders. Now, a little bit of help coming the way of the Finesco team here, which is something of a surprise. as we go back straight away up to the four leaders they're approaching now towards the top of the climb and in fact there are now a little bit of counter-attacks coming from the main field and uh, this is going to eat very quickly into that three minutes 33 second lead of the four men like Gert Jan Turnis there in second place now this is what the situation has been this is why the Bonesto team didn't panic before they knew that as they got nearer to the finish other teams would then feel the chance that they would have of getting a stage victory. That is, in fact, Gert Jan Turnis coming through, putting the pressure on from the TVM squad. And, in fact, you see, Bonesto haven't accelerated. They're just letting these riders go clear. For them, nobody is really important. The man that they're worried about is Tony Rominger. So they're staying back to keep an eye on things. Gert Jan Turnis, who goes away here. And the other rider who's come with him is Pascal Hervé, always on the attack. And the Novo, my rider, is Philippe Luvio, former French champion, chasing now the current French champion. There's Luvio. Had a tremendously unlucky tour, Novo, my. They lost their great sprinter, Wilfred Nelson. They've been wandering around like a headless team ever since. They've got no real man to work for. Uh, Charlie Motte, likely to win the stage, but not likely to win the Tour de France anymore. And I was talking with the newest member, Patrick Jonker, who is listed as a Dutchman because he has a Dutch racing license, but in fact, uh, is very much an Australian. And Patrick, in his first year as a professional, found himself in the Tour de France just two weeks before the race began. And he's now beginning to enjoy it. He relies very heavily on the Australian Neil Stevens on the rival team. Neil comes up to him every day and tells him where to position himself in the bunch. And they're great friends. So this is the breakaway. And Bortolami doing the lion's share of the pulling. They fly now steadily over towards the summit of the coach, uh, Du Montfaucon. Giron taking a look uh, if this is the last climb of the day. Well, good news, Jackie, it is. Uh, but there's still one spin to come at 150 kilometres, and then it's on down to the finish in Kaor. So there in the distance, you can see the banners. The end of the climb. And it looks as though they're not going to spin it out, which isn't surprising. Bortolami leading Hodge, Jackie Durant and Serpolini over the top. The gap is down to 3 minutes 20 seconds, but they haven't been caught yet. We'll take a break. Oh man, that's 
better. Welcome back. It's another road melting sun protection factor 35 day here in the south of France, which makes this stuff, despite the fact that it's free, the most precious commodity on the tour. Riders will be losing water by the litre out on the road and replacing it is a full-time job. When heat becomes visible, you know you're in trouble. And in temperatures like these up in the 90s, riders can lose body weight by the kilo. Exactly how much is critical to performance? Because a loss of 5%, which is well within the realms of possibility, is equal to a 20% loss in power output. Yesterday, even Miguel Ingerain took on water, which is unheard of for him during a time trial. And this morning, the riders were loading up for another scorching day. On a stage like this, each man will start with two three-quarter litre bottles and take on another six on the road. Lots of work for the domestiques. At the end, it's straight into the speed rehydration drill, as demonstrated here by our own Chris Boardman. On the subject of post-race rehydration, I'm sure you'll have noticed that most of the bottles in today's piece have a very famous logo on them. That's more to do with the needs of the sponsors than the needs of the riders. No cyclist, when he comes across the line, wants to drink hot, fizzy Coke. What is in these bottles is either ice-cold water or an isotonic drink like Gatorade. Sorry to mention a rival firm, but that's what the riders drink. Back to Phil and Paul with the race on the road. Well, thanks, Gary. And now we're with the leaders. And again, the day is an absolute scorcher as we approach the last time bonus sprint of the day at Savignac. 150 kilometers now have passed by and this has been a chase all day to bring back these four riders and they haven't done it yet. Bortolami is the man with the most to gain. He's hanging on by, by a hair to second place overall now in the race ahead of his teammate Tony Rominger. And it looks as though now we have four riders totally committed and they could still succeed. Now I wonder in fact if they'll allow Bortolami the last time bonus sprint on the open road today and the answer, I think, is no, Paul, because it looks as though Jackie no Bortolami. Well, it, we can't tell from our camera position, but that was Bortolami taking on the Jackie Durand at the front there. That's the last time bonus sprint of the Tour de France this year on the open road. We've got the sprint time bonuses on the finishing line today, and then they're all gone. Bortolami has uh, taken around about 12 seconds today, slightly more, perhaps. And if he gets a bonus in the finish and wins by about two and a half minutes, then he will be second overall. And look at this, Paul, the final drive on, drive on from the team manager here. But you know, those four riders fully deserve it today, having broken away in the first two and a half miles, four kilometers of the stage, a cheeky attack for a man who was so far up the overall classification. And he's put a lot of pressure on Bonesto. And now, in fact, the Palti team have come to the front and started now to chase along with Bonesto. So they might feel they still have a possible chance of catching them. The four leaders under 10 kilometers to go. There's the result of the sprint. Duron getting it very close indeed from Bortolami and Serpolini. I think there's been a problem here, Phil, because in fact Bortolami is no longer in the three leaders. And in fact, I heard that he had a little bit of a problem. If the camera could just turn back, I think he may well have punctured when we were off, off, uh, off camera there. And now the three will know, they'll sense that they're not very far ahead of them because they can spot the escort motorbikes and making sure the road is clear up ahead there. An attack by Jackie Giron, just as we cut back to the picture and Giron has gone. And that's a great move. Hodge seems itching to want to join him but hasn't done so. He's leaving Serpolini to try and close the gap. And Serpolini, I'm not too sure whether those young legs have got much left right now as Jackie Giron has attacked. And that's a good move at this stage of the race because the chasers might come up and unless one of those tell him that Duran has gone, they may never know. Well, this is the way Jackie Duran won his national championships a couple of years ago. He jumped away and it was just about on the line that they caught him. The same scenario happened this year. He was actually dropped many, many times in the national championships. And then with a couple of kilometers to go, he launched a great counter-attack and the sprinters came and died just a couple of centimeters behind him and he took a championships again. And you see these two riders look very tight here. Serpolini's going, he's not getting a great deal of help from Hodge, but he just lifts the pace a little bit. Very good move by Jackie Duron there. That was the way to win this stage. If he can just keep it clear now, he's got about seven kilometers to go to the finish. He's really got to keep the pressure on. The only way to win 
uh, from a group like this is to win alone because then you know that you've got the victory. The three riders here about to catch uh, Bortolami, so then the race is going to take on a different atmosphere because he knows they're there. He will start to work with them, and he was the strongest man of the four-man group that was been in the lead from the first few kilometres. As Chiesa there just taps Bortolani and says, come on, we're here now. In fact, it's now coming through that it wasn't a puncture to Bortolani, but a mechanical problem with his bike which cost him the gap with the leaders. He's gone back now to the four chasers, but, you know, looking at his face now, mentally, I think he's been broken here. And although he's gone back to the three chasers there, I'm not too sure he's got much fight left in him. Now, the crowds here are going to love this. Yes, I'd love a rider who will actually try and get clear and go for a solo victory. That's the best way to savour a victory because he'll be able to savour it all the way down that last kilometre as he comes down here towards the finishing line. He knows now that he's going to get the victory. Those two riders who are with him, they're completely out of the picture now. The chasing group of four riders are one minute and five seconds back in the main field at the four kilometre banner we're at two minutes 30 seconds. So the victory today is going to go to the champion of France and whatever people have said, you don't get so many lucky victories in life and if you keep coming up with them then i think it's a question of you make your luck by riding at the front of the race and there it's official one minute 12 seconds he's ridden away from them with a superb show of time trialing technique jackie Giron is now going to lift the cloud off the tour de france because we're going to have our first french stage winner it's coming to town we're visiting for the tour for the first time which i find it very strange to believe because uh, Cahors is on uh, many race routes, but never before been on the Tour de France race route. And the mayor of the town here has made a great welcome to the Tour today, all day. There we are, two kilometres to go for the four chasing riders. I tell you, that's the first time he's dared himself to glance over the shoulder and what he will have seen is a long, straight, empty road. So very shortly now, he'll begin to enjoy his Tour de France. He'll start to salute the crowd when he knows they're not going to catch him, and I think he's going to take the best of it very shortly, because he's not a man for the overall, he's a man for the day. And I, he indicated there as if our cameraman, who is French, has said it's OK to him because his hand flicked on the left-hand side of the bars. He's really giving it everything. Every last little bit of energy is coming out of his body here as he comes onto the fixed camera in the finish straight. He's all over the road, looking back all the there time. Go. A quick wave to his team manager, Bernard Kuben, who's going to be a happy man tonight. So that's just a final look over. Professionals don't make mistakes and allow riders to creep up on them. And now it's all over but the shouting and the glory. This time is not important to Jackie Duron, but the victory is, believe me, because this has lifted the pressure off the tour now. A Frenchman has won the stage. On go the sunglasses. You pay me, I'll wear them. And he looks over his shoulder and says, that's it, we've done it. The first time the race has come into Cahors, the champion of France, Jackie Duron, crosses the line and throws kisses to the crowd. It would be wonderful to see if Stephen Hodge could get his best ever finish. Here they are, they're going to shadow box it out and watch your tails because the chase isn't far behind. But Hodge wants second place and Sir Polini even within it. Look at the back, they're coming up on them and they're going to try and get them. Bortolami is leading the sprint and uh, in fact I'm not sure whether Hodge is he's playing a cat and mouse tactic here with Sir Polini. They could be wiped out in the sprint, there's still 200 yards to go as Bortolami wants Hen to come through. Hen hasn't got the legs, and Sir Polini goes, and Hodge just let him go. He hasn't got the strength. So the youngest man in the Tour de France gets second, and that's a marvellous result for him, as Hodge of Australia just about gets third on the line, but they were right on him. And uh, my goodness me, Bortolami was almost on Stephen Hodge on the line. I'm not too sure, in fact, whether Bortolami didn't get it. Mario Chiesa brings home the last of this breakaway, which gives us now seven riders in as we've got Francis Moreau on the left of our picture and now uh, in fact the little green jersey of Abdul Jabarov waiting until he sees the line of Gertjan Ternice, fourth or fifth in line also going to have a little dig too Uwe Raab is coming but it looks like a battle and Jan Zerada is taking on uh, Abdul Jabarov and Olaf Ludwig and Abdul Jabarov looking at the ground and this time he beats Jan Zerada and that makes something of a change It was only a short stage today, but Jackie Duron will remember it for the rest of his life. The French champion winning in 3 hours and 38 minutes, ahead of the youngest man in the race, Sir Polini, who finished 55 seconds back. In third place, the Australian, Steve Hodge. 
And on the podium, Duron waves to the crowd who rise to their feet at last the Tour de France has a home winner. And Paul Sherwin on the finishing line with a very disappointed Australian. Steve, that was a great ride today. Were you surprised when uh, towards the end Jackie Duron got it clear because he looked to be suffering on the climbs? Well, uh, he wasn't suffering as much as I was, but that was definitely the tactic I knew he was going to use. And when um, uh, Bortolami stopped to change his wheel, that was an ideal opportunity because the, uh, the lamprey with us, he was a bit stuffed as well. So, yeah, but there wasn't much I could do about it. Tell us about the heat out there because this is probably one of the hottest Tour de France's I've known for many years. It's incredible. I don't know how I managed today. My heart rate in the last half or so was um, was what was equal or over my threshold. I was really worried because I was thinking, shit, I'm getting a sunstroke here because my heart rate was really, even on the flats, was up around my threshold. And um, it was I was actually quite worried about it because I was up 170, 172 on the flats coming around the river here. Before we even started the climb, I was at 170. And before, <laughs> that's my threshold. And I was really worried that, you know, my heart was just going through the, going through the roof. The first full day in yellow for Miguel Indurain, now leading Tony Rominger, two minutes, 28 seconds ahead. Up to third place now, Gianluca Bortolami, and down from third to fourth, Armand de las Cuevas, with the two British riders still riding high. A huge smile from Miguel Indurain on the podium in Cahors this evening. And now let's join Paul Sherwin, who has with him Chris Boardman. Chris, have you ever raced in conditions as hot as this? Uh, yes, but I didn't find it very pleasant then either. So it was a pretty nasty day with the heat. Uh, I'm running on empty now. It's a really unpleasant day. Uh, I got stuck behind that crash uh, in the middle of the race, or towards the end of the race. So I didn't panic. I just kept riding until uh, until the GB boys, who most of them had come down, uh, came back past and slapped onto that. Indurain's team are really setting a heavy pace at the moment. It's not a hard pace to chase down, but just an uncomfortable tempo. It was quick today, but not hideous to sit in there uh, if you were feeling okay, which, which I wasn't. But um, I don't know. I mean, I think they've got to do that for quite a few days now. It's pretty tiring. I think it's really going to be a case of let's get to the mountains at the same time, and then it's down to Indurain, and that's why he's a team leader. And that's the big question everybody in England wants to know at the moment. The mountains. Are you going to carry on tomorrow and try and go up to the top of Hotakam, or are you going to stop before then? Uh, I would imagine I'll be stopping before then because I'm feeling really tired now uh, and I think I'm starting to do some damage. So it might be time to call it a day this year. Uh, I may start tomorrow, uh, I may not, uh, but I have to discuss that with the boss tonight. I've given it my best shot, but uh, now I'm starting to go downhill quite rapidly. So for the first year, it's not so bad. We will, of course, keep you up to date with the story of Chris Boardman in our programme, which comes to you tomorrow night at 8.30. Just time to remind you about our weekly competition. This Sunday, the race goes a little under 200 kilometres away from the mountains in Castra down to Montpellier. It starts high and finishes on the flatlands, so it could be a day for the sprinter. It could be a day for the breakaway, as Bo Hamburger showed us last Sunday. We'd like you to try and name the winner when you think you know who it will be. Here's the telephone number, as always, 0891 444444. That's 0891 444444. The first prize will be the yellow jersey of the leader on the day and signed by him and also a copy of the signing in sheet on the stage in England between Dover and Brighton. Well, here in Cahors for the first time a French winner, but there's no doubt about what the band from Spain thinks. They think they already have the winner. Until we see you tomorrow night, goodbye. Good night.